Honestly, Vikings were pretty much the same as any other medieval people. They were farmers and handymen most of the time. Most Vikings lived on a farmstead and they would have had to have been able to grow crops, tend livestock, and create all the tools they'd need to maintain their homes and animals. But that's not all. Vikings were versatile and able to turn their hands to anything they wanted to. Things started to change as Viking settlements became larger. If you lived in a small community, it was less likely that you'd be able to find a fun job. You had to be able to do many things from farming to fixing barns to hunting and skinning for furs. As the Viking Age progressed and settlements became larger and more urban, it was easier for people to specialize in certain trades and get known for their work. In this video, we are going to talk about five interesting occupations during the Viking Age. Welcome to the Viking Vault. Shipbuilders Vikings are known to be incredible sailors, but they wouldn't have gotten very far without good boats to sail in. Sadly, there's not much historical evidence that has survived to describe exactly what Viking shipbuilders would have been doing on the day to day, but we do have other evidence from sagas, laws, and the boats themselves that survive in the archaeological record. From examining these preserved ships, we know that Viking vessels were clinker-built, a construction method that involves overlapping planks which are held together by rivets, and made waterproof by applying tarred wool. Although there would have been many men working on a single ship at any one time, it seems as though the craftsmen would have specialised into different roles, with some people working on the keel and others on the bow, and yet others providing the planking. In charge of everything was Hofud Smidia, the master shipbuilder. This person would have been responsible for the design of the ship, sourcing all the required materials, and most importantly, payments. While this would have been a prestigious role, it also came with a lot of responsibilities, and the master shipbuilder would have been liable for any number of fines if the work wasn't to the right standard, or wasn't completed on time. After the Hofudsmidia came the Stafnasmidia, the most experienced boat builder on site who would have been responsible for the shape of the hull. Building the hull was the biggest task for the team working on the ship, and probably would have taken the stem smith around 1,000 hours to complete. For a dedicated and experienced team of shipbuilders, it would have probably taken them about 7 or 8 months to complete the ship. In comparison, a modern replica took the team 4 years to build. The work was incredibly detailed and required a lot of knowledge, including sourcing the correct materials for each part of the ship. Different woods were needed for different elements, including willow for the tree nails, oak for the planks, pine roots for tar, and hemp for the ropes. The shipbuilders also had to be experienced sailors, as recent tests of modern replicas showed that the ships would flex in rough waters, and therefore would need to be repaired or be braced in winter to reduce the flexibility of the ship. Viking Bead Makers Not exactly the job you imagine when picturing a Viking at work, but an important position in Viking society as their beads were beautifully wrought, laid a foundation for solid trade routes, and showed a person's status and wealth. Grave goods, the material possessions buried along with an individual, are complicated to decipher. The value that we place on certain items doesn't necessarily translate into how Viking Age people would have perceived things. For example, the famous case of the Burka burial shows how wrong we can be. All of that aside, beads are a common grave good find, but show us the skill of Viking craftsmen and the scope of their travels. Bead making is also linked to urban settlements, as farmsteads and small villages wouldn't have been able to support artisan craftsmen like this. We know that Vikings specialised in single colour glass beads, as shown by a grave in Burka, where beautiful blue and yellow beads form a necklace. Vikings were crafty and made good use of the resources around them. Archaeologists have unearthed tesserae blocks from Roman mosaics in Scandinavian trade centres, indicated that Vikings were reusing the glass mosaic tiles to create their beads. This could have been due to the fact that it was difficult to make glass, leading to a scarcity of this material in the early medieval period, and the associated status boost that this would have given both people who make beads, and those who could afford to buy the beads. We've been able to track mosaic tiles to trading towns like Ribe, Denmark, where they would have been melted down in Viking workshops and reworked into beads. It seems as though Viking bead makers had some knowledge of chemical composition, as a recent study at Aarhus University has shown that the white Viking beads were actually produced by crushing gold linen tesserae. This is apparent in some white Viking beads, which actually still have flecks of gold in them, and tiny air holes, which makes the beads opaque. Rune Carver Although the Vikings mostly relied on oral tradition to pass their knowledge and stories from one generation to the next, they did have a written language too, the younger Futark runic alphabet. 
Carving runestones was a laborious and intricate affair, although the younger Futark was easier and more accessible to the average Viking, and there is evidence of runic inscriptions that were completed by non-professional rune carvers on materials like bone and wood, including graffiti, record keeping, and even naughty messages. However, a professional rune carver would have been an esteemed member of society, as creating runestones was a difficult job. In order to do it properly, you would need to be a master stonemason, and as such, rune carvers would have been in high demand to create those imposing pieces. Literary records don't show much about who these rune carvers would have been, although we do have over a hundred names of rune carvers from Viking Age Sweden. This is thanks to the practice of carving your name into a finished piece of work, although it wasn't always the case, and so there are still hundreds of anonymous runestones that we can't attribute to anyone. It has even been speculated that there is a linguistic connection between the word Erilaz, a person who is proficient in runes in the Proto-Scandinavian, and the Old Norse word for chieftain, which is Jarl. If it's true, this might mean that there was an upper class of rune masters in Viking society, but there's not enough evidence to support this theory. Even if we don't have the linguistic evidence to support it, it's highly likely that skilled craftsmen like rune masters would have been held in high regard in Viking society. One of the most prolific rune masters of Viking Age Sweden was Upier, active in the late 11th to early 12th century in Sweden. Upier has been linked to the rune master Visate, either as his apprentice or as a close associate. It seems as though Upier created at least 100 runestones in his life, 50 of which he helpfully signed so we know for certain that these were his work, and another 50 that he probably did but didn't sign. His art style is particularly known for its elegance and control in the depiction of the runic serpents, as shown in the runestone that you can still see in Uppsala Cathedral. Lawspeaker The position of lawspeaker was probably one of the most important positions in a community. When a person was accused of a crime in the Viking era, they would have raised their grievances at the thing. This was a meeting where disputes could be discussed and debated, and the outcome would be agreed upon by a group of the village leaders. One of the key roles at the thing was that of the law speaker. The law speaker, as the name implies, would have memorized the entirety of Viking law. Viking society was predominantly an oral culture, which meant that they didn't have anything written down, and particularly not their laws. So, when the time came, the law speaker would have been called on to recite the relevant law and any other important facts from memory. Not only this, but he would have been responsible for keeping track of everything that was discussed and decided at each thing, and for making sure that all the agreed upon punishments and fines were carried out. Not only was the law speaker responsible for representing the law, he also played a vital role in representing the rights of the common people. A law speaker could speak on behalf of the people of a community to the king and defend their interests. As befits a prestigious office, the law speaker normally came from a well-off family and often was considered a lifelong position. Nice if you could get it. In later centuries, the law speaker became more involved in ruling and would often be part of the king's council. One notable law speaker is Snorri Sturluson, the Icelandic poet and historian who served as law speaker in the Icelandic parliament on two occasions. Viking Women And let's not forget about the women. Viking men may have gone off gallivanting, but Viking women still had lots to do. Viking women were in charge of the household and raising children, whilst also doing skilled work like making clothes, churning butter, and making alcoholic drinks like beer and mead. While it's likely that women married to craftsmen would have helped their husbands' businesses, little is known about women's roles in urban settlements. Not everything revolved around the homestead, though. In the Viking Age, women used to practice medicine and practical magic, using herbs and family remedies to help cure the sick, or create charms to drive out bad spirits. This leads on to our final interesting occupation in the Viking Age. For a woman, she could find power in being a spekona or vulva. Vulva is the word to refer to a female shaman, while spekona would be more specialized and more likely refers to a seer or prophetess. Doing magic was a woman's work, and vulva weren't actually all that popular, although their services were held in pretty high esteem. In the Voluspa, Odin came to speak to a vulva to learn of the gods' futures. If you wanted to start working as a vulva, you'd often have to be an older woman who didn't have any family ties. It wasn't becoming of a regular Viking woman to practice this magic, and so Vulva would often be older women surrounded by a group of younger people who would travel throughout the land with her. In times of crisis, powerful leaders would send for the Vulva to advise them on the best course of action, and she would get paid well for her services. 
There are a couple of references to the job of Vulva in Viking sagas, the first of which is in the Land Nama book, where a Vulva gained the reputation as the filler of inlets after she used her magical powers to bring fish to the fjords during a time of famine in Iceland. Another famous instance of a Vulva saving a starving settlement comes from the saga of Eric the Red, where a young Vulva is summoned to help relieve the settlers' suffering. It's said that all dwellings needed to be cleaned and prepared before she arrived, and she was treated with honour taking the high seat that would normally be reserved for the lord and lady of the house. Her task the next day was to perform the seor to avert the famine, which she did with the tools she brought with her. The saga tells of how she was able to see far enough into the future to be able to advise the settlers, and therefore they could avoid the famine. Thank you for watching this episode of The Viking Vault. Please leave a comment below on your favourite Viking job, and do subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying these videos, as it's really going to help us out in these early days. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next week for another one. Have a great week. Cheers.